right, good morning, everyone. Looks like people are starting to log in. It is our Thursday session today, and we are doing Crocs. I'm just looping a couple of videos at the moment while everyone comes in. Uh, it's just a video of a croc in an estuary down near Mission Beach. You can just see him pop up there now. Um, but pretty cool little creature. He's probably about... Uh, it's going to block that one there. I'll move that up. There you go. About three and a half meters, I'd say. Not huge, but still pretty decent. So we'll let uh, we'll let everyone start logging in, and then we'll uh, take away with our talk before too long. Hey, good morning, Elena. Morning, Steph, and kids. Hey, morning, Graham. Morning, Paul. How are you? Hey, folks, send us a uh, send us a comment in the uh, section, the comment section there, uh, just with who you're with, uh, what your kids' names are, and how old everyone is. Um, and if it's just you, send through yourself. Um, but yeah, shoot us shoot us a message with who you got and how old and uh, what they want to know today, and we'll see if we can uh, answer some pretty cool croc questions as we go. So if you missed the start, I'm just looping some videos at the moment uh, showing a croc in an estuary uh, in Mission Beach. The tide isn't moving there, um, so this croc's just kind of cruising around. <clears throat> hey, good morning, Candice and Heath and Tildy. Six and four, awesome. We're going to have some fun croc stuff today. It's going to be a little bit more complex than normal, but it's going to be a cool story still nonetheless. Alrighty, well, let's get started. Um, we've got a few people in there now, so we'll, we'll get kicked off. Today we are talking about crocs and essentially movement and migration rather than their basic kind of behavior and what they do and what they need. Um, later down the track, I might see if I can get someone to link in with us, uh, someone that might be a croc keeper or feeder, someone from maybe Hartley's Croc Farm or, or something like that. I'll put some names up later and hopefully we, we can wrangle one of those lads in to have a yarn. Um, but we, I'll try and get them in to talk about crocs in general. But today we're actually going into ecology research. So we're going to do a three-part series on ecology research from around the world. It's going to look into today crocs, and I think I've got two other pretty cool uh, animals, plants, fungi lined up with research from other countries as well. Um, but today I thought we'd do something about crocs that's very, very interesting and very clever and shows how smart they are and how well they've evolved over the years. Now, a lot of us know that crocs are very, very old. Essentially, they've, they're, they're dinosaurs, living dinosaurs. Uh, their, their evolution has barely changed in 200 million years. Um, so they're essentially somewhat about as close as you get to perfect animals, having, having been barely changed for that many years of evolution. So an amazing animal we get to look at today. Hey, good morning, Maxine. Uh, hello, uh, Kylie, Violet. Jake and Roman. Hey, Steph, Ruben, Audrey and Meredith. Good morning. Hey, Briley. Good day, Nuffy. Hope everyone's doing well today and enjoying your isolation, staying at home. The new, the new term we've got, self-isolation, stay at home, all of that. So I hope everyone's having fun. We are going to dive into it pretty quickly here. And it's going to be a little bit complex today, but I'll try and break it down in a fun way. So as I was saying, we're going to have three studies over the next uh, few weeks. And we're going to look at the ecology studies that are incredibly complex in what they've done and try and break down why they've done them and what they've actually done. So today we're looking at crocodile movement and migration. So crocodiles is an 
you don't we don't perceive crocodiles as an animal that particularly migrates and in the term of migration uh, we could say that maybe they do or they don't um, but I'll explain today some of their other larger migration patterns that some of the younger individuals do um, but they have some very very interesting local migration movements so we're going to go through that pretty soon I'll bring up an image today of the three studies that I've been looking at uh, to talk about today modern Jaden all right here we go so we've got three studies uh, Steve Owen was actually involved in some of these uh, probably most likely on the research and capture side. Um, so we've got our first one, we're looking at satellite tracking, revealing long distance coastal travel and homing by translocated estuarine crocodiles. So the crocodile we're looking at today, guys, his scientific name is Crocodilus porosus. Now that's the saltwater crocodile that we have in Australia. He's the dangerous one, he's the one we've got to watch out for in the waterways. So today we're going to be talking about him. Now we've got two species of crocodiles in Australia. One is the saltwater crocodile, Crocodilus porosus, and the other is the freshwater Crocodilus johnsoni. Um, so the freshwater croc isn't really a problem for humans. He is a smaller croc, uh, likes fish, and isn't predatory towards us. Only in accidental situations do people end up having a, having a bit of a strife with them. So today we're going to talk about the big creepy cool amazing saltwater crocodiles crocodilus porosus so across here this these are what ecology papers look like guys so these are studies where scientists or ecologists or or practitioners or people from around the world uh they do a study for a certain reason they've observed something they've developed developed a hypothesis which is what we were talking about uh earlier in our in our experiments episode um, so they've developed a hypothesis, now they're going to test it through research. Um, so here's three examples of ecology papers that have been written um, by various people. Now if you look at the top, you can see who's written them. So we've got Mark Reed, Gordon Griggs, Steve Irwin's been part of this one, uh, Danielle Shanahan and Craig Franklin. Um, you'll probably see a few of these authors repeat across there and they're most likely crocodile experts that have been involved with these studies. So what you have when you look at these journals is at the top we get what's called an abstract and we get to read that and that summarizes the paper so it might be a 14 page paper and it summarizes it in one nice neat paragraph so you can get a, get a gist of the papers for you and then the rest goes into what we talk about signs with introduction and methods and and the uh the results and the discussion and that kind of thing so these are the three big papers we're looking at today one's based on crocs that were relocated to see if they would move um, another one is based on crocodiles using surface currents and tidal currents to move and another one was based on the home range utilization of crocodiles and how much males and females move within their own home range so pretty cool stuff we'll get to some cool pictures eh let's have a look here we go now here's a crocodile this one is up in weeper it's not a huge croc uh, looking at that picture it might be around three three to three and a half meters not really really big um, this one's on the bank in Weeper now that day the tide was moving quite a lot and so what we're talking about today is tide movements and crocodiles not wanting to be caught up in that water at the time because they don't want to go with the waves and so he'll come up on the bank um, which which is potentially what this one's doing here it's it's doing a couple of things it's getting sun so it's warming up its body uh, crocodiles are reptiles so they are cold-blooded and they rely on the sun or the water to stay warm so in winter when the air is actually colder than the water then uh, they'll actually prefer to be in the water to stay warm because the, the water's warmer so here this guy's out he's getting some sun and staying warm warming up his body um, but he's also avoiding going somewhere he doesn't want to because the tide which is running at the moment might take him there this is a big fella now you can see he's quite dark this is on the east coast of Cape York we flew over him in a helicopter and took a photo. Now he's a much bigger croc. He is four meters plus. Now it's hard, very hard for us to be able to get an idea of size of crocs. And most of the time when you hear say someone say, I saw a six meter croc, I would say it's a little bit of a lie and it's probably more like a four to five meter croc. If you see a six meter croc in the world, that is an absolutely huge croc. Uh, a five meter croc in the world is an absolutely huge croc. Um, now on this croc here you can see he's missing a scale here 
there's a good chance that's actually here's a croc from a study where they've removed that scale um, to be an identifier of him. So on his tail there, he's missing a scale on his tail. Um, they might identify him by that missing scale. Potentially, he also lost it from something else, but quite often these days, what we see is scales removed, so scientists can identify individuals. Hey, good morning, uh, Teresa, Denise, and Wade. How's it going? Uh, we're talking about crocodiles today and ecology research around the world, and we're looking at movement and migration patterns in crocodiles based on a few research papers. Uh, Steve Owen was part of some of these as well. So here is a absolute whopping croc that we saw a few years ago in Cape York when we were flying over doing aerial work on feral pigs. Uh, really big guy. We saw him from way back and we actually circled around and the helicopter came back to take a couple of photos. Yeah, you can see how dark this croc is now. He is a big alpha. Let's zoom in. All right. Now that is a very, very big croc. Very jet black. Now their color ranges and a lot of the time... Um, there's nothing particular that determines their color. Um, that's part of what's thought at the moment anyway. Um, sometimes people believe they get darker as they get older. Sometimes people believe it's their environment as well. Um, but there's nothing too sure on that. So this guy's quite dark, very black. Um, but he, I think he would probably be close to five meters. He's a big croc. He's very, very big. Um, now, if you saw him in the wild on the ground... Uh, I think a lot of people would probably say he was a six or seven meter croc, but you barely ever see them that big, so. All right. Now, let's uh, let's do a little bit of a background on crocs and what they do. So, hey, good morning, Shannon. How are you, mate? Um, so they are a living reptile. They're very old. They've evolved over a couple hundred million years, and they've barely changed. So very, very interesting. Now, their geographic distribution in the world is quite big for this species. So for the saltwater crocodile we're talking about today, it is the biggest crocodile in the world, um, Crocodilus porosus. Now, their distribution uh, is all the way from India down to the Pacific Islands. Now, if you have a look at this, we've got them in India up in the top left there, all the way through Southeast Asia, through the, um, Indonesia, uh, the Indonesian archipelago, uh, Northern Australia and the Pacific Islands, so Vanuatu, Solomon Islands, uh, New Caledonia, places out there. So they're very well distributed for an animal um, that we think is just in Australia. I think I grew up thinking that they were just in Australia. And there's crocodiles all around the world. So we've got the Nile crocodile, we've got alligators, and we've got caimans in South America. So there's lots and lots of different species of crocodiles out there. Now, crocodiles porosis being the biggest is one of the most responsible uh, for deaths in people, unfortunately, um, partly because of its large distribution and the fact that it loves eating animals that are on the land. Uh, so wallabies and dogs are, pro are popular meals in Australia, the occasional cattle, a few other things. Now, the interesting thing about this map is, is that essentially when you isolate a population on an island, that's when you start to get what's called species diversification. So if you look at uh, Galapagos Islands as an example, um, the Galapagos Islands are a, a, a set of islands over in South America off, off Ecuador um, and they've been isolated from the mainland for thousands of years. Now on those islands, because the animals that on those islands were separated from the mainland, there's a barrier for gene transfer. And so over the years there's been natural selection for certain genes um, and over the years, uh, finches and turtles and lots of different things have, have evolved on those islands away from the mainlands. Now, if we look at this map, what we're looking at is thousands of islands where this, these crocodiles are. Now, essentially, if they were isolated, so if the Indian population was isolated from the Australian population, then over thousands of years, we would actually see the saltwater croc crocodile diversify. And so that would actually maybe become two species. So what's happening here is that there must be what is called parent stock. So uh, there must be travel in between these areas from certain individuals that's transferring genes across the world. And so the saltwater crocodile isn't actually evolving because of an isolated population anywhere. So there must be what's called gene flow in between um, the species distributed across the world. So essentially uh, what we're saying is crocodiles must be able to somewhat move 
uh, at least locally in between these islands. So an Australian crocodile might be able to go up to Papua New Guinea and across to Timor and so forth. And so that, that spread of genes across there is preventing natural selection and speciation or species diversification. So what we're going to talk about today is how that gene transfer happens and how crocodiles are essentially staying as one very success, successful species. Now what we believe they're doing is they're utilizing tides. So um, I'm sure everyone knows we have a bunch of tides, usually about uh, two tides a day, um, so up and back. And it's created by the moon and the sun. So the moon and the sun pull, have gravitational pulls and they pull on the earth. The water gets pulled either way. So depending on where the earth and the, the uh, moon are, earth, moon and sun are in relation to each other, there's different pulls at different times of the year and different months. So tides create currents as well. Now in intertidal systems, so let's go back to our video over here. Oh, yeah, let's have a look at this image even. So in this image here, we've got an estuary that's just off the beach at Mission Beach. It's coming inland. We've got a croc just over here near this bend here. Now, that croc is, uh, he's moving around a little bit at the moment, but not too much. And the tide's quite still at the moment as well. But in these areas, the tides will move. So water gets pulled out and then water gets pushed back in, which creates current and water movement. Now, what scientists have, have discovered, and in, within these three papers, uh, they've studied in the Kennedy River, which is up near uh, Lakefield National Park or Renewer in east, northeast Queensland, and in western Cape York as well, through various studies where they put devices in the water um, over 20 kilometers to log where crocodiles go. Um, they've actually discovered that crocodiles move if they're going on long distance travel, so that's travel three kilometers and above, that they will nearly always move with the tide. In short range movements, so short range is classed as uh, three kilometers in a day, so three kilometers a day travel, that's about it. They actually don't move a whole lot and they'll move with the tides or against the tide, so it doesn't matter. But in, in cases where a crocodile is gonna go from the top of the estuary all the way out to the beach, out to the ocean. If he's going to do that, nearly every time, in every case, those crocodiles would move within one hour of the tide turning. So let's say the tide's still, nothing's happening and the crocodile wants to get from right up near, let's say the top of the, the, the estuary there near the mountains, all the way down the beach. He's actually going to wait, 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 until the tide turns and it starts going out and he's going to travel with the tide. He'll always do that. Now, on long distance travel, uh, so travel over three kilometers and usually up to 10 kilometers a day, those crocodiles within the estuary that are doing that long distance travel will only travel with the tide. Now, if the tide happens to stop or change direction and go against where they want to go, the crocodiles either sink to the river substratum, so they go to the bottom of the river, or they go up on the bank. Now, that, and they could tell this because when they, they so they, they captured 28 of these crocs in the Kennedy River and they surgically implanted temperature and pressure devices in them. And these devices would also get picked up along the river by these sensory beacons. And so what they would do is they would trigger a beacon and they would say that croc is heading in this direction if it was on a long distance travel. But when that tide changed and it wasn't going the way the croc wanted to go, the croc would actually go, no, nah, I don't want any of this. I'm gonna go for a snooze and he'd go and sunbank on the bank and get some sun and warm up. Um, or either that, he would, or he'd sink to the bottom where the current's quite slower, and he wouldn't move at all. Now, and they could see this because in the croc's body was that little sensor that told him the temperature of the croc now out on the, out on the bank. The croc's body temperature quickly goes up because he's in the sun, above the water temperature. And so they could see this over about three hour, over a three hour period, the croc's body would, temperature would go up which would indicate that he was on the bank or that pressure sensor would change as well. So he'd go deeper in the river. And so essentially, if a croc wanted to travel long distance travels, it would only ever travel when the tide was going the way it wanted to go, which is incredible. Really, really smart for a crocodile. So we're talking about a reptile that's hundreds of thousands of years old in terms of evolution. And it is knowing that it's gonna travel more efficiently when it travels with the tides. 
So folks, if anyone has questions too, send them through while we're talking. Um, if anyone ha if anyone misses something or doesn't understand what I'm saying, please let me know and we'll go back and talk about it. So this is this is ecology. So we're going quite complex today, but it's very, very interesting. It has a lot of relevant applications in terms of management for these days um, for crocs as well. So let's take a step back actually and talk about our croc populations in Australia and what's happened over the years. So now if we go back to 1940s, so 1940 in Australia, our croc populations were pretty st stable and standard. Now there was two things that happened in the 1940s that all of a sudden catalyzed, that sped up uh, the croc culling in Australia. Now before the 1940s there wasn't much hunting done by of, of crocs and most of it was done by Aboriginals with spears and simply because our, the guns that we had in Australia back then that were commercially available, um, they weren't big enough to kill a croc. And so what happened in the 1940s was two big things. One was all of a sudden World War II ended and there was a surplus of rifles that were 300 calibre or above. So 303s and 308s, all of a sudden the war ended and there were lots of these rifles that everyone could get that were big enough to go and shoot a crocodile. Um, what people wanted crocodiles for was not just their meat, but their skin because everyone was into fashion and wanted that fancy handbag and uh, And so croc skin was a really really valuable commodity back in the day not a commodity Sorry, but a valuable uh, Material that people wanted to make handbags out of and it was uh, essentially a, a, a status thing amongst amongst rich people if you had croc skin um, So what would happen is uh, uh, so that was the first thing, crocodile rifles, uh, the, 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 the rifles became, uh, there was a surplus of rifles, sorry, and people could then shoot them. And the other thing was there was a market, a skin market in Africa that fell out, the market fell out over there. So suddenly the price of crocodile skins went through the roof and uh, lots of people in Australia started hunting. So all of a sudden they had guns and they had um, crocodiles to shoot. And the value, the skins were very valuable. So, from the mid 1940s till the 1970s, saltwater crocodile populations in Australia plummeted hard. Um, by 1959, saltwater crocodiles populations were that low that we started shooting freshwater crocodiles as well, and their skin wasn't as valuable because the texture wasn't right. Um, and so it wasn't until the 1970s, the early 1970s, that other states in Australia started banning saltwater population. Uh, saltwater crocodile uh, shooting and harvesting of the skins and eventually in 1974 I think it was uh, Australia banned Australia banned ours uh, yeah 1974 in Australia so we uh, in Queensland sorry we banned crocodile hunting here so from the 1940s to the 1970s crocodiles were nearly they were under under threat of becoming extinct I think because of their cryptic behavior they wouldn't have but they, yeah, they were under a lot of risk. So let's go back to this picture of this big guy here. He's really cool. Actually, let's bring up one of these. They're, they're quite beautiful too. So if you have a look close look here, this is a picture my brother took. You can see some march flies on his eyes. Um, probably sucking blood because it's quite cool. The, the veins had come quite close to the skin there. Um, now, <clears throat> so in those 30 years, crocodile populations went right back down. And over the last 30, 40, 50 years, they finally started coming up and starting to level off again. Now, we've got a question here from Audrey. Uh, she'd like to know if there is a way you can tell how old a crocodile is. Usually uh, by its size, that's definitely one. And by its teeth as well would be very uh, would be a very common way. So um, a male crocodile that gets to about four meters can get there in captivity and probably in the wild in about 30 years. Um, as they get older, I'd say their, their rate of growth probably slows a bit. You can have quite old crocodiles that are very, very, um, <clears throat> very dark or very long. Um, I guess one of their other ways and a, quite a common way in mammals to age something is by its teeth because your teeth erupt and then they wear, except crocodiles can always replace their teeth as well. Um, I believe there might be a way of aging them through their osteoderms or maybe their bones. So their osteoderms are these plates here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, interestingly, oh, look, you can see a march fly in the air just there flying along. Brilliant. So the osteoderms are these uh, bony scales here. Now, they some people think they might be uh, essentially solar panels, so ways of bringing blood to the surface and warming it up, which is pretty cool, and then helping them 
Uh, so it's like a bunch of solar panels along the body that help increase the surface area and, and warm them up faster. Now this this crocodile here, I, I brought these pictures in to show that there's a there's quite a few reasons why crocodiles migrate. One of them is mating and, and breeding. Another one is food, or not necessarily migrate, but move or, or their movement. And these photos were taken on a Western Cape Eco Tours tour in Weeper, which is a great tour company up there. Dave and Lisa own it, and Dave's a phenomenal guide, absolute Aussie larrikin, um, and, and guides phenomenally. But this photo is my brother. He took this, so you can find him at Shane Ross Photo. He has some amazing, amazing African photos if you want to see his pictures from over there, but they are phenomenal. Um, but yeah, this is one of his pictures of a young crocodile. Now, it's hard to distinguish males and female as well. Um, but if a croc's above about 3, 3.2 metres, it's a male. Females only grow to about 3, 3.2, and that's it. All right. How about this? So Shane, uh, again at the top there, if you want to find him on Instagram or Facebook, there's his, uh, there's his grab, his name. But this croc here is chowing down on a mud crab. So this guy has actually used the tides to find his food source. So he's come out... He knows, he or she, sorry, knows that as the water drains off the mud flats and through the little gutters that are in it, the crabs have to move as well. And so actually as the tide's dropping, he uses the tides to hunt. And so he'll go along the, the, the mud flats and he might even sit in the gutters or those little drains and actually patrol them looking for crabs. And this guy's got a nice feed of crab, as you can see there. Let's see if we can go in a bit closer. How's that? Smushing a crab in his mouth. Um, good feed. So this guy's actually used the tide for his favour um, to be able to hunt as well. Here's another one, another great shot. Now I'll move my uh, face there and you'll be able to see the rest of his body. There it is. So you can see he's balancing his body, his head's out of the water, his tail's out of the water to balance. And you can see his tail scales there. And he's about to chow that crab really. Yum, yum, yum. Next one, here we go, another great shot there. And all right, back to the mat. So how's that? That's pretty awesome, isn't it? Beauty. All right, so we've covered how crocs over the years have, uh, have been culled, their population's gone down and then it's come back up over time. Uh, they're at a level now where people that never used to see them in the 70s and are used to their levels being low are starting to see a lot more crocs around and in, in places where they probably used to be, um, but people aren't used to seeing them there. So you see a lot of uh, contention in the media about that sort of stuff. Now, the next interesting study that was done, very, very phenomenal, was done. And Steve Irwin, I believe, caught these crocodiles in about 2003, 2004. Um, and they actually relocated these crocodiles, but they put trackers on the back of their necks. Um, uh, they they anesthetized some of the scales and sewed them through those those scales that I mentioned before. So you can see on the back of his neck here, he's got four. And I'm pretty sure from memory, this is where they attached those um, satellite tracking devices. Um, so they drilled little holes in those osteoderms there, those scales, put wire through them to hold the um, the satellite tracker on. And they're actually able to, to monitor over days where these crocodiles went. So I'll bring up a couple of maps, and it's quite phenomenal what these crocodiles did. <clears throat> now, I'll, I'll try and go this through this nice and slowly. But what we're looking at here is, let's look at A, the one on the left, the map on the left for now. This crocodile was caught in the Wenlock River. So the Wenlock River was one of the Irwin's very popular study sites. Um, it's supposedly one of the best... Uh, nest has some of the best nesting habitat habitat for crocodiles in Queensland. Um, very wonderful, and so they actually caught these crocodiles in a uh, in the Wenlock River, and then re they relocated the first one up to the Jackson River, and actually monitored it moving back over time, and it used the surface currents in the ocean to move. And so what these crocodiles were doing was just like they were moving in the estuaries themselves. They were actually using ocean, so residual ocean surface currents um, to move through and back home easily. So they actually knew where home was and they've actually trialed by putting magnets on crocodiles' heads um, if they have a magnetic ability or a honing ability like turtle, turtles and migrating seabirds. 
um, if crocodiles are able to mag uh, to go back home using the, the Earth's uh, magnetic field. And it seems like they are because magnets dis disturbed how they would go back home. Now this first one, uh, Crocodile A, let's call him, went from the Wenlock River up to the Jackson River on the 25th of August and by the 20th of September, so a month later, he was already home. Um, now I believe that croc averaged about seven kilometers a day. He moved seven kilometers a day and the way he did that, now crocodiles being reptiles, they don't have a great aerobic ability. Um, so they're not athletes. They're not out there doing Usain Bolt sprints, um, 100 meters in under 10 seconds, ridiculous. They're, they're just cruising. They're very uh, low cost energy animals. Um, and quite often sit and wait predators. Um, so they don't want to exert a lot of energy to move, but they're smart enough to know if they catch a current in the ocean that they can go home a lot easier. Uh, easier. And so this guy, he moved back home within a month, that first one. Uh, looks like we've got a question here from Candace. How many eyelids do crocodiles have? Uh, I'm not a croc expert. It'd be best to ask a couple of guys, but I know they've got at least two. Well, they've got the normal eyelid, which we have, they also have a membrane across their eye called a nictating membrane that I believe can move as well. Um, called a nictating membrane that gives them some sort of vision underwater as well. Um, so there's at least two, I guess, what you would call eyelids in there. Hey, Katrina, how you going? Hey, Ben and Brett, Tani and Charlton, welcome, welcome, welcome. Talking about crocs, lots of fun stuff and ex exploring how smart they are. All right, now let's have a look at our Nesbitt croc, so croc C. Now this guy was caught in the Nesbitt River, relocated down south on the 14th of September and in a matter of about three weeks he made it back home as well, utilizing again surface currents. Now he was traveling at about 11 kilometers a day, which is phenomenal for crocs. Same thing, he waited around, some of these crocs actually waited and waited and then, excuse me, traveled as, as, the, uh, as the ocean currents became favorable, they traveled fast with the currents. Now, if we have a look down the bottom, folks, um, let's try and uh, see how we go here. If we can, oops, sorry. I'll move my head there so we can see that graph. There we go. Now, if we have a look at the graph on the left, what it shows is the date from when that crocodile was relocated and the distance it traveled each day. So you can see that first croc, he didn't move much in the first couple of days. He might've just been sussing out where he was, but crocodiles are, we believe they're territorial. Um, and so what he did was he just stayed locally for a couple of days and then all of a sudden he had this massive movement of distance. Um, so there was one day he was traveling nearly 9Ks a day. Um, there's another day where he traveled about, that looks to be about 16 kilometers in a day. And that would have been these big movements down the coast all the way back to his home. And some of these crocs were seen right back at the exact spot that they were captured. So it shows quite what's called uh, site fidelity. Um, fidelity meaning they want to be back where they were, so they're, they're, they're locals to an area. Same thing on the other side, this crocodile moved a lot quicker than the other one, so potentially the ocean, the ocean currents were more favorable, so we got to move with the ocean. Uh, and you know how like in Finding Nemo, they say there's the EAC, and Crush catches the EAC dude and he's cruising through it. Um, similar for these crocs, so they're actually catching these currents on the water and traveling with them to make it much easier for them to travel. What was the distance from the Jackson River to the Wenlock? Uh, from memory, that one was about 50 kilometers. Um, I'd have to check. Um, yeah, I'd have to check the exact figures on that one, um, Teresa. But yeah, from memory, the, the, the other two were a bit shorter. They were 50 or 60 Ks. And then this one, which I'm about to show you now, he was phenomenal. No, not that one, not that one. Where are we? There he is. All right, now this one was a distance of about 400 kilometers in about 20 days. Um, so let's have a look here. He has moved, so he got caught in the Wenlock River. He was a bigger croc. Uh, he was relocated from the Wenlock River to the east coast of Cape York, a distance as a crow flies of about 120 something kilometers. But the total distance for him to get home was about 411 kilometers, and he did that in 20 days. Now, if we look down the bottom of his graph, he actually didn't move for quite a while, and he might have been getting his bearings. He might have been figuring out where he had to go. Uh, just uh, We've had roadworks here, so I'm just figuring out if I need to close a window or not. I don't think so. So if we have a look at the bottom of the graph, 
nothing happens for quite a while. So he got relocated on the what looks to be the 16th of August. He was relocated from the West Coast to the East Coast. And from the 16th of August till about the 24th of November, so nearly three months, um, he stayed in that same spot. He didn't move around a whole lot. It might have been okay for a while, but he could have been quite stressed as well because he could have been moved into another Crocs territory. Uh, he wouldn't have known where the food sources were. He wouldn't have been familiar with the area. And having that site fidelity that uh, he likes to be home, he actually decided, no thanks, I'm going home, bugger this. And so... I'd say around the, what looks to be the 24th, not the 4th of December, he starts moving back. So you can see on the map here, uh, he's hung around home for quite a bit. And then all of a sudden, 4th of December, he started moving. Now, he would have been catching those ocean currents too. Apparently around uh, de December that time of year, is a time, and it's also a breeding time. So he's probably trying to get home for the breeding season because he's missing out. Now, those ocean currents that time of year, apparently northerly, going up the east coast there. And so he gets to the East Coast. And then what happened when he hit the Torres Strait was he actually took a break on the island. He had pina coladas for three days, just having a bit of a suntan. What happened was the currents actually switched on him in, switched on him when he got to the top. They were going from west to east. So they're going against the direction he wanted to go. And he took three days off and just stayed on the beach. Now, the day he resumed and went back through the Torres Strait Islands, back from east to west was the same day that the currents were going the same way he wanted to go. So the exact same day the current changes when he started traveling again. He took took his he'd taken his little holiday and he started swimming. Now he went back down, 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 and then eventually returned to the exact same spot he was caught. So that took over four months, but the time he was traveling was only about 20 days. So if we look on the east coast here, 4th of December, he got to this point here. All of a sudden, 18th of December, so 14 days later, two weeks, and eventually the 24th of December back up in home country. So about about two, three weeks it took him, 20 days or so. He did 411 kilometers, which is absolutely phenomenal. Um, now, I've got a couple of little videos I want to show you here of this too. So before we go there, actually, the, a couple of the questions, and I said we'd go through the questions why people were doing these studies. Now that first one we talked about, about intertidal travel, so travel within the estuary with the tides. Um, we wanted to know how they were moving and how they were using their energy. Um, so how, and also how is it that they haven't diversified across multiple continents? Are they moving with the tides and they moving with these ocean currents? Um, and how are they utilizing these currents to travel? Uh, the other question we're asking is, is to the, the question we're asking in this, this topic, is, is relocating problem crocodiles to another area successful or are they just going to return home anyway? And so these three cases here where crocodiles have been relocated and then come straight home um, says no, maybe, maybe relocating crocodiles isn't the answer. <clears throat> There's so much more to this and it's a very complex topic that it's hard to say yes or no to anything, but it's, it's good evidence in one direction anyway. All right, I'm going to play a couple of videos here. Uh, they are the videos of these crocodiles moving. So the first one's a 3.84 four meter male. Hold on, let's pull them up. Here we go. Let's go back to the start. <clears throat> so this is one of the crocodiles that was relocated starting on the 18th of December. And over those few days, you can see the, the ocean currents along the side of here too. The direction of those is the same as the croc. So he gets back down here. And he's actually going all the way down to the Norman. Actually, this is a different, different crocodile than those other two, sorry. Um, but he's a slightly smaller crocodile. He went back down to the Norman River. Now, here is our big fella uh, that we were just talking about. So, 411 kilometers, 19 days. And this is the way he went. Now, you can see the, um, the currents at this time of year are favorable for him to go up. And they kind of switch on him at the top there. He gets to the top and he takes a bit of a break up here. And then they change again and he starts moving all of a sudden down here, 19, 20, 22, 24, and then he makes it home. So pretty unreal. Let's go through that again. He's coming up. <clears throat> He's usually, mostly using the currents. And then he gets back down, all the way down to the Wenlock River where his home was. So absolutely phenomenal. Really smart. Knows that he can use the ocean currents to travel and save energy. Now the average speed... 
um, that these crocodiles are moving when we compare in the last study where we're comparing long distance travel to short distance, remembering that short, short distance was about three kilometers a day within their own territory. That speed for short distance travel was always 0.01 meters a second. So quite slow, oh, 0.1 meters a second. Now for long distance travel, it was usually on average 0.8 meters a second. So nearly a meter a second, those crocodiles are moving when they were doing long distance travel within the tidal estuaries. <clears throat> so that's pretty cool, phenomenal. Very interesting, you can see how smart they are. Just very, very interesting creatures. Alrighty. <clears throat> now our third study, um, I'll just bring up a, a generic picture here. Let's bring up a cool one. Crocodile, eating a crab, beauty. Now, the third study that we looked at was um, based on how they move in their own system and based on social conditions. Looked at males and females, and what they found was happening was uh, females would often be in one area for breeding that was usually in the area of, uh, of the, the system that had fresh water in it and was just at the verge of the tidal area. So there were four crocodile, four female crocodiles that were tagged with sat taggers in this last study. And they found that when they were breeding, they would stay in that area. But the females could move huge distances if they wanted to, up to 50 kilometers um, to go to a, a, a site that was better for breeding, uh, for nesting, sorry. So when they were breeding, they were often in areas where there was lots of food, so potentially lots of barramundi, lots of crabs, maybe lots of cr uh, pigs. Um, so lots of food because they needed to build up their fat store so they were nice and healthy to, to get all the energy to lay those eggs in to move. And for whatever reason, and their reasons unknown, they would actually move large distances to go and breed. Now three of those four crocs moved downstream a bit there, still in brackish water, so partly salt, partly fresh, but they went to an area where there were these neeper palms, so these kind of floating palms, and there was good nesting habitat there and they nested. One of those four female crocs, she actually went nearly 50 kilometers upstream to a different area where she could lay. Now quite, of, quite often the females are nesting in uh, brackish or freshwater areas um, and they're using a uh, substrate that's, um, and they make mounds and domes to, uh, to generate heat because they're, they're being a reptile, their eggs are also uh, temperature dependent um, so that the temperature can determine the sex of the eggs. And so she creates mounds with uh, foliage and leaf litter um, and quite often reeds. So they go to freshwater areas or inland lagoons where they can fold over reeds and mounds. Now, hopefully when I get one of these guys to talk about crocs in, he'll talk about all the funny, cool, interesting stuff about how they breed. But the important thing here, what we're talking about today, is these movements. So they, the females will actually move a long way to go and breed, uh, to, to nest after they bred. Now they found in the males, quite interestingly, that there were two different types of movement that the males would do. Some males would either stay in the area and that <clears throat> what they would be doing there is they would be staying around there because their method of passing on their genes to be successful was to stay in one area and breed with as many females as they could. And they were, and we, we think and we believe that the bigger crocodiles we would stay locally in the area and they were territorial and the, what the, the technique they would use is essentially um, protecting their females and mating with them. Now the second movement strategy we found in males was they were younger, often younger males and a bit smaller, they would be nomadic. So instead of territorial, um, they would actually be nomadic and they would move large distances through the estuaries, uh, sometimes out in the ocean and into different estuaries to find mates. And so what they were actually doing was they were being sneaky and they were trying to find unprotected females to mate with. So two different strategies. Um, this, the study we're looking at didn't say that it was significant um, in that size would determine whether they were territorial or nomadic. Um, but the, the study is, the researchers believed um, that that was the reason. And the three crocs um, that stayed territorial were actually a little bit larger than the three crocs males that went away and were matic. So by about the crocs that were territorial were about 4.2 meters compared to the, the crocs that were nomadic about 3.8, but still very, very big crocs. Um, so quite interesting. So the males had different ways of moving as well. And now we, we know they move for food sources um, and we know that they stay within territorial areas, but there's been studies done in Cape York. Now let's see if I can bring a Cape, I'll bring up this Cape York map just for an example here. Um, 
So there's been studies done where crocs from down along the west coast of Cape York here have actually moved to an island up right up at the tip called Crab Island. They've relocated there, done these massive migrations just to go and feed. And what happens on this Crab Island at certain times of the year, hundreds upon hundreds of flatback turtles come up to nest. So they go up there and all these turtles are nesting, big, big turtles. And they're also, um, the hatchlings are coming out. So there's, and, and there's a brilliant documentary on this. I think it's called The Reptilian Battleground. If you want to look it up, you can find it, I think, on YouTube. But phenomenal documentary, Reptilian Battleground, it's called. Um, you can see these crocs coming up to try and either eat the hatchlings or catch potentially catch a, a, an adult turtle. So they were actually migrating. These crocodiles were migrating and probably using the ocean currents to take them there to Crab Island just to feed before they'd actually come back and then stay for the mating season. So really, really interesting um, behavior there, folks. Uh, we, we, what we've seen today is that across these studies, we've seen that crocodiles use the tide to move and will nearly always move with the tide when they're going on long distance travel. So travel more than three kilometers a day. Um, nearly every case they would be moving with the tide to save energy. Um, if they were staying within their area within three kilometers a day, short distance travel, uh, it, it wouldn't matter so much. Now, if the tide would go against um, the direction they wanted to travel in their long distance travel, they would either go up on the bank and sun themselves, or they would float to the bottom of the uh, sink to the bottom of the river and stay down there until the tide changed in a favorable favorable direction. Now, that second study, they relocated crocs from the west coast of Cape York to the east, or from the from the west to further north. Each of those three crocs traveled all the way home doing about 7, 11, or 20 kilometers a day on average. So huge differences you can see on this map here. Um, we'll blow it up a bit. That croc there moved huge distances to get back home. So potentially management Im implications there. So maybe relocating crocodiles does not work, but uh, more study had been need to, need to be done there. And then our third study was looking at uh, where crocs were within a system and the social interaction. So often you can have big males overlapping, we've found. You can still have big male crocs overlapping and being okay with it. Um, and the social interactions there being that females are often in that, that intertidal zone, kind of fresh, kind of salt water for breeding uh, before going away to their nesting habitats. And then the males are either nomadic or territorial. So males will stay in one area and protect the females they want to mate with. And that's how they... Um, uh, endure their genes and, and and the other males might go away you know they're nomadic so they're moving around trying to find my, uh, females that are unprotected so a few interesting facts there today about crocs folks they're very smart they'll move for food they'll move for breeding and they'll also move if they're relocated to go home so quite smart very very interesting individuals um, i will put the links of those three papers up when i post this video later um, but yeah, really phenomenal. Uh, I also want to bring up a few uh, these lads today. So here we go. We've got uh, six Instagram accounts here. And these are blokes that I consider to be really entertaining and really, really knowledgeable. As well as, of course, that Facebook page I shared earlier of West Cape, West Cape Eco Tours. Um, but these are six accounts that I think are really good to follow. So we've got Mark Norman Croc Guide there. Mark's a, a really entertaining uh, has a brilliant voice and he runs crocodile tours down in Proserpine uh, in the big systems down there. Unfortunately, obviously, with tourism being down at the moment uh, because of the coronavirus, uh, Mark's uh, taken a bit of a break from his work. And then you've got Matt Wright, who runs that phenomenal TV show over in the Territory, and he's got his tripod croc that's absolutely huge. I've just seen today he's got a croc called Bone Cruncher. Um, if you have a look at his Instagram account, that he can be in the water with, and it's massive, and he can, you know, say stop and it'll stop. Uh, but for whatever reason, he reckons that's a one in a million relationship he's got with that croc um, that you just don't try with others. Um, croc Country Australia, young fella here called Jesse. He works at Hartley's Crocodile Farm, but he's also got a page called Crocodile Country Australia. And it's got some great content there. Same with Bill Collett, Oz Naturalist. He works at uh, Hartley's Croc Farm there, and he's also got some really, really good information. Now, Hartley's Crocodile Adventures, that, uh, that image, that text didn't finish there, but they're... Their grab is Hartley's Crocodile Adventures and they have some of the best uh, guiding and crocodile stories within a, a, a local lagoon um, and, and farming-wise as well. And then there's the Solo Whisperer there. 
Uh, he's, he's quite entertaining and he's got some really beautiful pictures in the Danger River of crocodiles, kingfishers and other bird life and just really interesting to follow all around. Uh, all right, we've got a question from Teresa. With all the crocodile studies, has there been the ability to see how far the same genes have gone back? Um, personally, I'm not sure. Uh, I'd have to go through later and have a look uh, at some of the studies done online and see if they have. But I would I would bet, Teresa, that there definitely has. I just haven't read them yet. So I can have a look at that later and, and try and get back to you on that question. That's a really, really good question. Oh, and the wild man, yeah, the wild man's got some good stuff too. Yep, yep, good on you, mate. <laughs> yep, yep, the wild man's got some good stuff. So the wild man's in there. He's got some great content. But um, there's some great people to follow there, folks. And these aren't the only ones for sure. They're just some of the guys I happen to follow. Um, but yeah, get out there, find some of those blokes and, and just follow them. There's some great content. And hopefully we'll get someone on to uh, have a talk about crocodiles and some of the more interesting things around their lifestyles as well. But if anyone's got any questions, uh, send them through right there. Send them through. Type me some questions and we'll answer them. And uh, otherwise, uh, we'll finish up with a video of those crocodiles that we watched earlier. So here we go. This is in uh, an estuary at Mission Beach. And the tide isn't moving and we see this crocodile just slowly cruising around. He's not going too fast. We'll take it forward a bit here. We come around this bend and we can just... I've got to move my face here. There we go. So we can see that croc there just in the water. Just cruising along. Alright. Here he is and we, I think we get a little bit closer and have a look at him. Looks to be a male. He's, he's a decent size. But he's just cruising and he's curious too. He's curious at what the drone's doing. This has taken quite a few years ago now. Um, but yeah, you've got to be careful with, with your filming equipment, of course, and respectful of animals and their, their environment too, so very important. Well, folks, no, no questions coming through, so thanks for joining in in today's session. I've got a couple of brilliant ideas for our next couple of sessions on ecology research around the world that I'll be bringing to you. Um, super grateful that everyone's joining in. I hope what we're giving is educational. Um, on Monday, it's Easter Monday, so there's not going to be a normal session, but what I might do is I will jump online, and if anyone has any questions, any questions at all based on any of the previous talks, we're just going to do a Q&A session on Monday, nice and easy, nice and cruisy, and we'll just do that. So if anyone wants to jump online on Monday, uh, I know it's a public holiday, so no one's probably doing homeschooling or anything anyway, but if anyone has any interesting questions that they want to ask, uh, let's do it on Monday anyway, we'll have a crack. All right, folks, till then, happy Easter, stay safe, stay home, and take care of everyone around you. Big love if you can. Uh, it helps us keep giving back. Um, find us on Instagram or Facebook and follow us. And we'll keep delivering as many, as many of these videos as we can and keep delivering this awesome information. So cheers, folks. I'm Rossi from Cockatoos. Take care. Big love.